Welcome to the Diffuse Podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello and welcome again to another edition of the Diffuse Podcast. This one I'm I'm I always say this, I know every time, but I'm really excited about this because I've got a, a good friend, Benjamin Barentine. So Ben and I met um, when I was in Montana uh, at a threat assessment uh, conference and, and, and Ben and his team are also there, but also presenting. And um, he's got a pretty interesting backstory. Um, and it's interesting because he knows his subject from being on both sides of the fence in terms of being an adversary, using it tactically, but also defending against it. And I think that gives him a really unique perspective in terms of how is an adversary going to use this? Because he's done that. So very briefly, Ben spent 15 years in the in the US military, uh, everything from being an infantry soldier to serving in their special operations, intelligence, extensive experience, as I've said, with social engineering, digital exploitation and cyber targeting. He's worked with the NSA, National Security Agency, the US Marshals, and NASA. And uh, then he moved into the private sector with 360 Privacy, who are, who are a company that I use. They're, they're a fantastic bunch of guys and a great company. Um, ben, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Yeah, glad to be here. So I've given you a brief um, introduction. What would you say? How would you describe yourself? What would you, if, you know, if you were, or if I say if you were, I am asking you, Kind of, what is your background? How how did you come to be skilled in this area? What what's the what's the story? Yeah, so uh, again, military kind of made my way up through special operations and found myself uh, in the signals intelligence uh, realm and uh, loved it. Right, so that's a very tech world, tech enabled world, and um, I you know kind of thrived once we. Once I moved over into that space um, and and absolutely loved it, um, everything from computers to cell phones to social media, everything online, the interconnectivity of it all um, was was fascinating. Um, and so, uh, eventually, found myself building out, you know, as this you know, kind of digital targeter throughout different countries. And, and uh, I like to say that, and I, I tell clients, you know, it was my job to find out where bad guys live, who they hang out with, where they hang out. And, you know, how long they hang out there now. So it was kind of like a stalker, right? A digital <laughs> stalker, uh, putting these pieces together and then handing them over to uh, whatever team uh, that was requesting it. And it, it was so much fun because it was, you know, almost like putting a puzzle together. It's that investigative itch. Um, and uh, so I did that for a number of years. I kind of then came up with uh, what we call it, you know, the digital protection program where start teaching other commanders, ambassadors, uh, embassy workers, uh, special operators that were going out the door as well, how to protect themselves from uh, people like me, near peer adversaries. Um, and uh, it always kind of blew my mind how, I wouldn't say how easy, but the ways that we were able to kind of exploit certain targets with all of the tech enabled services around us. Um, and, you know, so I started stripping away what we were actually doing to, to be able to get into the inner circle or get into certain networks. And um, at the end of the day, it comes down to the human, right? You know, so, we, you know, social engineering and whatnot, obviously tech enabled social engineering. Uh, we started coming up with a program on how to defend ourselves and did that for a number of years. And then obviously, brought that program, that same program to 360 Privacy, and, and here we are. But um, it's been a wild ride, very fortunate, um, and I, I absolutely love the topic. So, again, thanks for letting me be here. So when when you went from the kind of infantry into the special ops teams and then signaling intelligence, I mean, would you describe yourself as a techie? Would you? Are you a technical person? I would say I would never um, – I'm never going to be the the most technical person in the room. You know, and if I feel like if I ever am the most technical person in that room, I should probably find a different room. Right. Um, but I I've always loved tech. Right. Um, I would like to say that um, I have found a nice balance between the tech and the physical world. Um, I always loved playing and taking t- playing with um, like the little gadgets and taking things apart and putting them back together as a kid. Uh, all the um, you know science is one of my favorite uh, subjects and but then also how things work right that was always kind of that 
that itch. And I think that obviously helped me um, when we moved over to the the, the tech world. Um, but also I've got clients there, you know, they'll call me a, a hacker and I was be the first person was like, no, 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 <laughs> that's, that those, that's a whole different breed. Um, uh, you know, and those people, the people that are able to do that are uh, exceptional. Uh, but it's being able to, I'd like to think that I've found a way, uh, or I found a home where it is tech and the human element, right? How to apply very simple technical capabilities to the human element. Um, and that's where I am, right? You know, I, I know just enough to be dangerous, uh, you know, a jack of all trades kind of thing, but not really hyper specific, like, you know, the true hackers and whatnot that you see online and that in the Hollywood uh, makes it look super sexy. Yeah. But but I guess you must have had an inquisitive mind, because if, if you're looking at, yeah. you know, what makes things work and how do we use that from an offensive end, and also, you know, now you flip it onto a defensive perspective in terms of, okay, well, how do we stop ourselves being victims of that? That requires a degree of, of inquisitiveness, of being open-minded, of, of mm -hmm. being wanting to practice things and, and, and strip things away and all that, as you know, you're, that you weren't mentioning it yourself. So you must have that innate quality anyway, or interest anyway. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you start thinking about it. Um, I remember when I started developing, you know, the quote unquote digital protection program is like, okay, how are we really doing this? And then you just kind of linearly look out, look at the attack surface and then, okay, well, here's this defense mechanism. Well, how would I defeat that? And it's just kind of go backwards one step and one step and one step until finally we kind of figured out where that line is where, okay, well, if you can do this, it prevents seven different outcomes. Um, and so that's where we, you know, started with, you know, essentially the human element, the education piece, you know, fishing and all that kind of stuff, the, the human enablement of a lot of these exploits. Uh, but yeah, it was definitely the clockwork of, okay, how do I fix this? And then very analytical, backwards planning, um, figure out where the soft spots, you know, I have a whole talk on becoming a hard target. Um, and so when you, to become a hard target, you have to fill those soft spots, those weak areas in your digital footprint or physical footprint, depending on which side of the house you're on. Uh, but, uh, you know, on this, the digital side, we're hemorrhaging data all the time, right? We're carrying cell phones, laptops, we have Facebook, social media. But then, so it, when I saw that, it, I just became infatuated with it. Like you said, um, trying to figure it out figure out where those soft spots are, being able to fill them. And then just seeing by doing three or four very trivial things to protect yourself, it makes the the world of a difference. So, so we're going to get into some of, some of the terminology and the, and the real basic mm -hmm. stuff in a minute. But can I, you know, if you've got somebody like, you know, you're protecting a, a client or, you know, you mentioned ambassadors, et cetera. Presumably, though, if you've got the Chinese state coming after you or the Russian state coming right. after you, there's there's not a lot that you and I can do or the average person or even the average nation state can do to protect from that. Correct. Right. And so we, you know, we tell clients too all the time, you know, what we're going to be teaching you and what we're going to be doing is going to protect you from 99 percent of attacks coming in. Right. Your your small criminal organizations, your everyday exploiter, the kid down the street that's just bored and living in his mom's basement, you know, little things like that, where 99% of the issues we see come from. But right, if a nation state is coming after you, um, that that's a, a whole other animal, right? Uh, because of the way that they are enabled and their ability to manipulate um, either networks or the the funding that they have for certain exploits. You know, a lot you hear all the time, Pegasus and in these zero click exploits that are always in the news. You know, once you start diving into that world, it, it becomes something much greater, yeah, much harder. Yeah. Okay, so let's start the basics then. So, so um, you know, I I we've we've chatted about this, and you know, I think there's lots and lots of terminology that's that's in our daily. Uh, conversations, I suppose, when, when we're talking about security and we're talking particularly about cybersecurity. But I'm not always convinced that everyone's on the same page. I'm not always convinced everyone really understands what some of those terms means. And I think quite often we're all too embarrassed to say, sorry, what does phishing mean? And what does this mean? And what's a whale then? And all this sort of stuff. So can we can we go through some of these, the sort of terms that you come across on a daily basis and, and, and just kind of 
explore them and, and in layman's terms we we call I don't know if you've gone the same but in the UK we call it the idiot's guide to to whatever yeah. um and I I'm happy to be an idiot because I'm not te- uh, hugely technical believe it or not so you know what let's start with fishing what is fishing how, how do what does it mean and how do they do it right so um fishing the just a really easy way to put it is we all get those emails they're wanting you to click a link right they're fishing they're they're trying to get you to enable an exploit right so they want you to click a link open a file whatever it may be in order to um put the malware let's say on your device right um so that's something that i like to call you know it's human enabled right you are clicking it there has to be something that's done on the device for that malware to be um activated and it's always the human aspect of it, right? And so um, it can be either a text message, it can be an email, it can be a DM in your Facebook or whatever it may be. They come in all sorts of sizes and shapes. And especially with AI now, you know, it's getting harder and harder to actually uh, to, to see it. And so that's why we kind of we really put the emphasis on the education of the person, of the client to actually see it, look at it and be able to recognize it. Uh, but the phishing as a whole is just playing off of a human's, you know, ignorance to to click to some, something, right? Because of just exactly what you're saying, right? Um, oftentimes, we as humans, no one wants to raise their hand and say, hey, I need help. Hey, I don't know what this means. And so, you know, attackers are playing off that. They want you to be ignorant and they want you to not ask for help. And so they're trying to get you to enable their malware, their exploit. So why would somebody try and fish me? I mean, as just a kind of normal bloke on the street, why would they, why would they, are they targeting me or is it just a mass marketing thing? And why are they targeting me? Why am I being fished? So the way I teach it, there's kind of two different philosophies here, two phases of an exploit, right? So you have opportunistic targeting, which is, you're on a list uh, with 100,000 other email addresses or, or phone numbers, and all 100,000, 10,000, however many people are getting the same email, they're getting the same traffic, and they're just hoping, literally fishing, think of like a big net, right? They're fishing for someone to click those links. They're looking for a soft target. Now, you may click it once or twice, and now you are identifying yourself as a soft target. And once you do that enough, you're going to go from just that big open list, which everyone gets, not necessarily you, just an opportunistic targeting list. Once you've identified yourself as being susceptible and and being a soft target, a weak target, now that's going to go into directed targeting, right? Now you are actually going to be targeted as a person, and that's where they're going to start building out a a pattern of life on you. Think of it like a targeting package, you know, your likes, dislikes. Um, You may start getting targeted emails from, um, you know, you may be looking at you know, with your, your cookies, right? So you, you've all been on Facebook and you see, hey, I was looking up pack and plays or or baby baby items and another tab well, on your, your Facebook, you're getting ads for those, right? That's all building out your pattern of life and who you are. And as an attacker, if I'm going after you, I'm going to start using that against you and sending you emails, maybe a five, 10% discount code, for whatever baby item it is, you can say, oh, awesome. I was actually just looking for that to get you to to click that link. Um, and it could be either for uh, credential stealers, which is, you know, where they're trying to, it's a fake login page. They're going to give you, you're trying to give out your, your uh, email address or your password. It could be um, anything from bank accounts, credit card numbers, whatever it may be. Um, but that's where it is. They're playing off of you to to click that link. And so, um, where do they get our details? These lists is that is that where kind of breach data where they 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 bought it on lists that are sold on dark web and all that sort of stuff. Where when our data is accessed and sold, that's that's where they generate the list from. Yes and no. Um, so oftentimes it is on those data breaches, right? Uh, but it doesn't have to be depending on the country. You know, uh, here in the states we have data brokers. You know, there's hundreds and hundreds of data brokers that will sell everything from your home address to your social security number, to your email address, your phone number, and then it links it to your entire network of people, family, friends, everyone. 
uh, which with 360 we get rid of. But then in other countries, like we were talking about earlier, where you don't necessarily have the data brokers, it is all about data breaches. And it's about uh, scouring the deep and dark web and looking for what is out there. What can I do to connect you or connect to you, right? And then once I can reach out and establish that connection to you and reach out and touch you, I'm going to start building out around you as well, right? Um, for instance, um, the, the MGM breach that's been in the news over the last month or two. Um, you know, that was a social engineering breach, right? That was a, um, we were, they were able to get an employee's information and then call the help desk and social engineer the help desk into giving them information. It's, it was very simple. I believe it was a 10 minute phone call uh, that cost millions upon millions of dollars. Wow. Um, and that was just from basic information they were able to find on either the dark web, deep web, or um, sometimes just OSINT, open source intelligence, grab it. So, 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 so what, are, what are we looking for? If we get an email or we get a text message, how do we know? So one of the examples I was going to use actually is, is what about when you get an email address from somebody you know, for instance, a friend or someone, but it's not actually them. Right. So they're either email spoofing or spoofing the header, whatever it may be. Um, and those are hard, right? That's where it comes down to either knowing that person, right? You know, does the, the syntax seem weird? Are they asking for something that's that's odd? Um, you know, we see a lot of times, you know, you'll get the text messages from your boss. Um, and again, my name is Ben or you know, Benjamin, but I know that, you know, Adam, this founder, CEO of 360 Privacy here, if he texts me, he's not going to say, hey, Benjamin, I need you to go get me something right, you know. Um, and so just kind of knowing that, and that's where it comes down to the human to see that. Because, again, AI is getting so advanced that some of these are being written well, but they're not necessarily being written to me, right, because it's because of that syntax. Um, other things you can look for will be, it may look like it's coming from me with my name, but if you look at the email address, the email address will be wrong. Um, or the um, when you're looking at the email, the body of the email, um, look for grammar mistakes, mistakes. That's where we see those a lot. Um, punctuation is a little off, or maybe it's over, you, the punctuation is overused, right? Because um, shorthand, right? If you're talking to someone that you know, very few times am I making sure that I'm going back and making sure it's grammatically correct. If I'm sending it to my buddy or a coworker, um, a peer at work, at least just asking for something general, I'm not going to make, you know, submit it as if I would an English literature paper. Right. Mm -hmm. But oftentimes these, the AI generative um, emails and whatnot, they're kind of, they're overdone. They're, they're too perfect. Right. right. Um, that as in life, if you're thinking about it in the physical world, um, Nothing really in nature is a perfect circle or or perfect in general. There are flaws, whereas human nature is the same thing, right? And so uh, looking for something that just looks off, looks odd. Um, I like to tell clients to develop their, you know, their spidey sense, right? If it feels wrong, generally it is wrong. Um, uh, there's a, another uh, philosophy of uh, we in the physical world, right? You go to... Um, a bad part of town. You uh, you're in the woods. It's or you something that feels wrong. Your situational awareness as a human in the physical world. We, you have your entire life ever since you're a baby. You're taught, hey, you know this is good. This is bad. This is this feels wrong, and your intuition starts kicking in. You know you're, the goosebumps start starts uh, coming out on your skin. You're like, ah, this feels weird. The tech world is so new, and a lot of times you don't feel that. It's harder to fill that space. And again, exploiters are going to use that against us. But developing that same sense of uh, self-awareness on the tech side, on the digital space that you do in the physical space, I think is step one, mm -hmm. right? It, it, it's by far um, the biggest defender is ourself and our, our consciousness. Sure. So if we move then from fishing... So whaling, mm -hmm. what's whaling then? What's what's that mean? Um, so with whaling, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't. You can take this out too. Yeah, yeah. I don't have a great definition for whaling. But, it, but it's, um, is it more kind of CEO stuff and and targeting bigger fish, isn't it? Right. Yeah. As far as okay, so whaling would be going after again a bigger target, yep. the CEO, yep. the top down approach. Yep. Fishing oftentimes happens from the bottom up. 
Right. Right. So you're looking for the support system and it's mass marketing, uh, whether it be whaling or spear fishing or whatever it may be, where it becomes more targeted right. to the CEO, to the C-suite, um, to someone that's a bigger prize, more yep. at risk. Um, oftentimes that what I've seen is that comes later. Yep. Um, once there has been uh, the support system has been has been attacked. Uh, one thing that we see are executive assistants, mm -hmm. HR, payroll, people that generally have access and placement to the same information as the CEO, but generally are not as well protected, right? One thing that we've seen in, in C-suites and a lot of companies, corporations, is there a lot of money that's been spent for good reason to protect the C-suite. And then oftentimes the EA or that support system, they're not as well protected, but as an exploiter, I know they probably have the same logins. Yep. They have the credit card information. So that's where I'm going to go to. Yeah. And um, one of the things I always think about when I'm looking at LinkedIn as an example is when people are advertising their new jobs, look at me, I'm just taking over the new directorship of ABC company. And I, and, and I speak from experience in terms of a, a relative of mine did that on LinkedIn. And we noticed that within a couple of days, all of a sudden was getting loads of emails and loads of connections targeting mm. that individual because they had a new role. So I'm guessing, you know, that is, that's a kind of vulnerability in terms of, um, I, I get back to a story years ago when I was looking after Heathrow Airport and we, we had this new runway that was being developed, might have you, and, and the, the directors are getting targeted. And they had a brand new director come in and somebody contacted the CEO secretary to say, I am this brand new director, but I've lost the boss's phone number. Or I don't think I've got it actually. Can you Could you share it with me? Because this individual was brand new and hadn't necessarily met everyone, they just gave out the number. So, oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, you need to know it. It's this. And it was actually one of the activists. And he, the direct, the mm. CEO then just got completely swamped and he, he had to change his number in the end because it just got exploited so often. But so this goes back to kind of we're giving out lots of information blind to the fact that what we think might be innocent actually is, is good tactical information for our adversaries. Right. So – you know what are they looking for when we are when we're blindly sharing our information other than the obvious emails etc what are they what do they go for what are they looking for to to target particularly when they're targeting the bigger fish looking at the the private clients looking at the ceos or right. high profile individuals they're looking forward to kind of get back to the ties into what we were talking about earlier those connections right we as individuals are are um, especially in 2023 we are so connected to one another, right? We have to be available for someone to reach us at all times. Um, you know, I can remember being in school when, you know, cell phones first started coming out, especially, you know, post 9-11, you couldn't have a cell phone on you in school. Um, you couldn't have, uh, you, you know, it was poor form to have a cell phone out or on you at all times. Now, it's irresponsible not to have a cell phone on you at all times and be able for someone to reach out and touch you. As an exploiter, I'm looking for those connections. I'm trying to figure out a way to bridge over because once I can reach out and touch you, now that's a connection. I like to call them pivot points in the intelligence space. Um, if we think about email signatures, right? So email signatures, it'll always be generally its name, your position, uh, the company you work for, Mate your uh, email address, and then there's usually a work number and an, uh, a cell phone number. Um, if you put your personal cell phone number in your signature block, at least, you know, in the States, those data brokers, it's so easy just to go take everything just from that signature block, first name, last name, and then your phone number, put it in. Nine times out of 10, it's going to pull back your home address. Because what do we do when we sign up for... Um, Rewards points, grocery stores, uh, gym memberships. These are not these are not credit card information kind of stuff. This isn't something that's going to touch your credit. These are very trivial things you're signing up for, but it's always your mailing address, phone number, and so that are all going to tie in together for that. Um, and then also playing off of like what you're saying, the human element of I know this person's new. 
we as a human being, I'm eager to please someone. Um, and, and so what I want to do is I want to give out. Absolutely. I don't want to get in trouble. Um, there's a, a great um, a great book that, that talks about uh, the truth default theory, where we as humans essentially lie more than we think we do. But we as humans also believe people more than we should. Uh, we think that people are always telling the truth more than they are. And what that causes is for, um, like you said, the executive assistant, why would someone, she, there's probably no way in her mind or that person's mind thinking that, oh, I, this is malicious, right? Who would do that to me? If I had a nickel for every time, and I'm sure you've seen it too, every time a client says, nah, who, I'm, I'm no one. Who would look at me? You know, why, why would someone come after me? But as a targeter, that's exactly who I'm going to go after because they don't have that awareness as high. They don't think they're being targeted. And so that truth default theory starts kicking in and saying, oh, no, that this email has to be real. Um, this phone call has to be real. Um, so. And then how do we how do we use all this data then when we're looking at generating fake IDs? I mean, you know, I, I we do a lot of, um, as you know, we did a lot of these vulnerability assessments and we're we're finding people's personal data and then using and then saying to them this can be used to create fake ids so how do people do that then um right so when you're going in let's say um i can build out um i, I find enough of your information well now i can go to gmail and i'm going to create a, a, a gmail account with your first name last name and put your real phone number in uh, they may do a two-factor authentication or, or verification, which is great now. I'll, I'll try to get everybody to get onto two-factor. Um, but if I can build out, not necessarily about you, right? So let me say, let me build out um, to your sister or your brother or maybe your neighbor, right? I know that you just, I see that um, you, you just move somewhere, right, into a neighborhood. Well, now I'm going to go and I'm going to try not necessarily to get your information, but your new neighbor's information. I'm going to build out this profile on them to contact you with and do the same thing like what that other exploiter was or did is, hey, I live two houses down. Welcome to the neighborhood. Um, you know, what's your phone number? Let's catch up or uh, let me, uh, I need to drop off something. I actually got a, 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 some of your mail. Is it okay if I drop it off? Whatever it may be, just to get you to believe as soon as I can get you to believe something or get you to, to trust me, then it's just a matter of time of that, that, um, those spidey senses to start kicking in. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so that, that's what I've seen the most is, and getting people into the mindset of, yes, they're targeting you, but not necessarily in the way that you think, right? They're going to be targeting your support system around you to get you to to do something because someone you already trust and know. Right. Yeah. So, so when we used to, we're not in the police, when we used to um, target people with undercover officers, as an example, we'd never put mm -hmm. the undercover officer directly next to the target. You'd feed them in through a vulnerable person, a, an informant, or right. someone who was in debt, or somebody you know, somebody that you knew was a vulnerability, and you'd feed them in that way. So, so it's the same sort of thing in terms of they're not necessarily coming direct for you; they're coming around your network and then slowly building in towards you. Exactly. You know, when it's when it comes out to you know another thing, your your pattern of life, you know, and your electronic pattern of life, EPOL. Um, so everywhere that your cell phone touches, right? Um, let's Wi-Fi. Your your um, when you're reaching out and touching routers, you're leaving like the digital signature. Well, our cell phones, for instance, right? You know, what's the point of having a smartphone if it doesn't do all the smart things that you want, right? So when it goes into you go home, you go to your office or your partner's house, you know, whatever it may be it automatically connects to the to the Wi-Fi, right? And we love that. It's easy to access. It's great. Well, what that's doing is your cell phone is, has a preferred networks list. Um, so it says, hey, you're my friend. I trust you already. I'm going to connect. There are a number of vulnerabilities attached to that. But the one, you know, for, for in this instance is if I as an attacker can get my hands on your preferred partner or your preferred networks list, now the old days of, trying to follow you and, and you know, surveillance and, and all that kind of stuff we see from the movies that goes out the window. 
I already know where you're going to be based off your human element, right? The, your electronic pattern of life. And so if I am sitting at a coffee shop that I know that you like going to just by ripping it off your phone or whatever it may be, now your brain is already saying, okay, this person was already here when I got here. So you trust them, right? So you, that's something you can trust. Same with what you're saying. If someone is brought into your circle by a trusted person, you trust them by default just because, hey, if you trust them, I trust them. And yeah. as again, as a targeter, you're you're playing off of off of that human element of trust and over trusting. So what are you saying there that when your phone so as you're walking down, you know, the high street or whatever else, your phone is mm -hmm. is basically kind of reaching out and and touching or connecting with free Wi-Fi services, if you haven't got the right settings or Bluetooth settings, et cetera. But do you then have to hack into that in order to get that information or is there a different way to exploit it? Not not necessarily hacking in, right? And, you know, like again, most of the time where, you know, the, the in the movies where you see, you know, the hacker in the lines of code, although that is very real in some instances, um, oftentimes these very, you know, trivial hacks or exploits are are just that trivial, right? It's we have a mismanaged settings on your phone and we are willingly giving out this information. Uh, there's a number of open source tools, you know, you can, for one of the more, more basic is Wireshark. You know, you can throw a packet out or grab a packet, throw it into Wireshark and, and be able to get those preferred networks because we are willingly giving them out. And we Oftentimes we we want to give it out because of the ease of access. Technology is great. I love it. Uh, I love AI. As long as you know we have certain um, in, certain things implemented to protect ourselves, absolutely. Uh, one of the, my favorite quotes is "The last to adapt is the first to perish." Um, and so, by us fighting tech, you know, we, we're kind of putting ourselves in a a bad spot there. But with tech-enabled services, our phones, they're set up to where they all want to interconnect, which is great. But from a security standpoint, we're, we're kind of putting ourselves in a predicament there where you got to find that balance of where you want to be with safety, security, and ease of access and comfortability. Um, and that's up to the end user, right? I've got some clients that would, you know, they want to they want to go back to the old flip phones or not even use phones, you know. Uh, but then, obviously, we in our line of work, we have celebrities, uh, pro athletes, uh, people that are in influencers, uh, where that's not an option, right? And so you have to come up with a plan for them to use their phone and stay connected to the world, but just put up those boundaries, and that looks a little bit different person to person. But yeah. So when you when you take on a client then and you're going to do the security briefing that you guys do and you you know you're going to I know that you go and physically meet people or go and do an assessment of a home and you uh, you do a whole kind of wrap around service. Mm -hmm. Talk us through that. What are you what are you looking to do with them? What, what's the sort of first steps that 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 the kind of basics about what you're trying to educate them on? So the first thing that we try to do when we go in is just make the client understand that they are vulnerable, right? Uh, oftentimes clients will say, Hey, I, I'm a nobody, or why would people want to come after me? You know? And so we kind of try to paint that picture of, you know, the why, right? You know, once, once a client, once a person can understand the why, um, then it's much easier to teach them and put things into perspective and paint a different picture for them. Um, I like to go from a macro to micro, uh, type of uh, of education where we're saying hey this is this is the world in which we live here are all the bad things that could happen from cell phones laptops uh financial fraud id fraud and you just kind of start asking those questions as what's important to you oftentimes it's it is identity theft it's reputation uh management or uh financial loss those are kind of the big the big three um, and so getting them to answer questions like that and getting them in the mindset of, oh, OK, I see the attack surface now. Once they can see that, then we can start going into now, how do we prevent that? Everything from locking their accounts down. If you look at it again, macro to micro um, on the Internet. So they have the cloud, um, cloud based apps, uh, accounts, with, whether that's your Gmail or whatever it may be. We want to lock all of that down. And then go and lock down the phones uh, or not lock them down per se, but just 
tighten them, tighten the screws a little bit to where we're not just willingly hemorrhaging our data. Um, so we do that from cell phones, we go to laptops, uh, then we go into the, the accounts and make sure there's two-factor authentication. Uh, we set up a VPN, a virtual private network that they can they can use. Um, and then we teach them how to use the VPN to where you not necessarily have to use it all the time, but when you're using, you know, you're wanting to do sensitive uh, browsing, right? Or you're sending information that is sensitive or financial related, you know, maybe you use a VPN. Um, I have three questions I always tell clients to ask themselves when it comes to VPNs is when you're connecting to the internet, um, you ask yourself, is it yours? Is it free? And is it secure? Right. If you can't confidently answer all those questions, then turn on a VPN or maybe or if you have to. Right. If you have to connect to the Internet, you know, turn on a VPN there. Uh, we do. We talk about browser compartmentalization. Um, so, you know, VPNs are great incognito mode and, and in private browsing. Everybody uh, likes to think that that protects you, whereas, you know, really and truly that doesn't really do a lot, right? That just protects your device or someone looking at your device from the outside in and saying, hey, you know, this person, you know, was looking at whatever, uh, where, you know, truly be protected, you need to use a VPN, browser compartmentalization, which is just using two or three different browsers for very specific things, such as using one browser for, um, for sensitive browsing. So that's, Everything from your your Gmail, right? And I always put or your your civilian email, um, and the reason why the importance of that is that's generally what you're logging into, or logging in with, right? Your email address, um, your bank account. I like to throw in telecommunications as well, um, just because of the whole e sim and sim swapping that's going on right now. So protecting those in a browser. Um, using another browser for anything that requires a login or maybe a payment portal. Um, and then another browser for general, I like to say Googling, you know, like how are cups made? You know, you know this, the general thought, the random consciousness stream, throwing that into something. Um, so we, we kind of have a holistic approach as to how we teach this each client. Um, <laughs> but the other th part of it is, is you have to um, you have to take into consideration the client. Right. You know, we have some clients that don't that barely use email, that don't want to use email, and they're not very tech savvy. They just want you to make sure that you're protected. And then we have, uh, you know, the you know, chief technology officers of major corporate corporations that I'll never be able to teach them anything tech related, but I can teach them how to protect themselves in some trade craft. And so, so knowing your client and knowing where they fall in that spectrum. So when you that talk about, when, when you talk about, um, browser compartmentalization, I can't say the word now. Compartmentalism. So are you talking about in layman's terms? You know, I use Google for my general surfing. Having right. a different browser, as in what, another Google one or or a completely different company to do other things and then a third company to do something different. Is that is that what you mean in terms of that? Yeah. That sectional? Um, Chrome Chrome has a, a an ability to create different profiles. Firefox has um I believe what's called um uh, uh, compartments that you can use. Uh, I tend to just push clients to use three different brands, yep. right? So Safari for one thing, Chrome for another, and um, Edge or you know whatever else, whatever you like. Yep. Brave is also a good one. Um, at 360 Privacy, we have the 360 Secure Browser powered by Talon. Um, that we love and we give to clients. And that's kind of what they use for the sensitive browsing. I usually tell them, um, you know, the three browsers can be a lot for some people. And so to make it just much more simple, most people have MacBooks. And so I say, you know, use Safari for your random thoughts and, and consciousness, conscious streams and whatnot. Uh, and then use the 360 browser for anything that requires a login, sure. right? Sure. So anything that has a, a credit card portal, anything that you're logging into, your bank account, stuff like that, using a secure browser yeah. in that way. So you mentioned VPN. So let, let's just mm -hmm. kind of unpack that slightly, because again, that's one of the things that lots of people have. I've got VPNs. What does it actually do? Uh, the best way to not get super techy with it is just think of it as an encrypted tunnel between you and your digital destination, right? 
Um, when you are looking at things without a VPN, um, but let's say uh, your company or you know a threat actor can see everything from your user agent strings, your IP address, to what you're looking up, where you're looking it up from, all sorts of things. And so when you're using a VPN, it basically just encapsulates it, right? So put it in that tunnel. Um, it's where people on the um, onlookers, so it may be your internet service provider, um, a threat actor or whomever, they can't really see uh, what you're doing. They can see something's being done, right? You are looking at something, but they're not able to see what you're looking at. Um, and so that's what that's what it's used for on that sense. Obviously, companies use it to be able to VPN into a server, right? You see that a lot from work from home situations now. Um, but the way that we're using it is using it to basically protect yourselves from onlookers from the outside. And so when I log onto my VPN, it allows me to choose a location. Mm -hmm. You know, now clearly, if I choose certain locations then the internet doesn't allow me access because they're restricted Correct. by nations in terms of, you know, you're outside the, yeah. the US, you can't access this, or you're outside GDPR, you can't access this. So one right. of the things it, it does then is it clouds your location about where you're actually based. Right. It can, it'll be able to, uh, you know, change your IP address to where it's a different country. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, people try to use it, maybe not anymore. I think they've caught on to it, but um, you know, when you're traveling internationally and you want to watch your favorite shows back home, yeah, right? Yeah, like Netflix, yeah. your your um, your Amazon Prime or, or whatever, maybe your Hulu, uh, being able to watch those shows from a different place. That's what you normally see. Uh, but then also too, um, everything from, hey, I need to access certain websites that I can't access in the States or I need to access certain websites overseas. Um, you can use it that way too. Sure. Um, on the offensive side, on the defensive side, you would use it to obfuscate where you are, you know, what you're looking up. Um, so again, to where if a threat actor is looking, they can say something's happening. I can't tell what's happening. Right. That's what you want. Yeah. If you can't see the credit card information, you're not able to see the logins or, you know, building out that, that pattern of life on you. Sure. So I go to a coffee shop and I log on to their Wi-Fi. Mm, mm -hmm. What's the risk around that then? What is what does that what does that how does that make me vulnerable? So you're on that Wi-Fi and you're on the Wi-Fi with everyone else in there, um, and so you're can, you're now in a shared space, right? Think of it, think of it that way. Um, now you're giving access to your computer and your traffic to not only everyone else that's on that network. But the owners of that network, right? There could you'd have no idea who is on the backside of that coffee shop um, looking at the network traffic. Um, and so, a hundred percent, you know, let's let me ask you those three questions. So you walk in there: Is it yours? Is it free? Is it secure? So, is it yours? No, it's not. Is it secure? No, there's free Wi-Fi in a, in a coffee shop. Um, and is it free? Um, so if you're if it's free, you are the product. Yeah. In general, right? Yeah. Um, and so once you can, if you can't confidently ask or answer those three questions, then use a VPN. Yeah. Uh, preferably not don't you know not to connect to them. Uh, but then also there's another threat mechanism there to where you don't really know if that is if that free Wi-Fi actually belongs to the coffee shop. Um, there could be a rogue router, a rogue box, a, a, a rogue Wi-Fi for layman's terms to where someone can throw up their own Wi-Fi, much like you can throw on, uh, you can connect to your cell phone, right? You know, a hot spot. Um, I can create a hot spot, call it Starbucks free Wi-Fi, um, and then just hope someone connects to my phone. Well, now I'm gathering all of their traffic, yep. right? Yep. Um, and so if someone is using a VPN and that happens, Again, I can see that they're doing something, but I can't see what they're doing. And what about when you're connecting via 4G or 5G? How does that change things? Um, so now you're not connecting to a local router, right? There's not a local host. There's no one local there to monitor that traffic. Now you're throwing it in. Obviously, it has different encryption levels. Uh, most of the time, depending on the country, um, you're, the telecommunication system is much more scrutinized than anything else. Uh, and in some countries, you know, uh, being exploited over Wi-Fi may be a misdemeanor if if they're even able to catch you do it. Um, but 
uh, messing with the uh, the telecommunications network, you know, say Verizon, AT and T, and everything. That's you know essentially an act of war, act sure. of terrorism. Um, and so there's so it's so much more scrutinized that their encryption levels are higher. So I always tell clients, at least you know in the states or where you can overseas, is to use your hotspot, right? Um, you connect to it. Um, again, if you are traveling uh, to a country that, you know, it's not your home country, just know, too, that if you are doing that, that whatever you are looking up is being routed through that host network, uh, host nation network. Mm-hmm. Uh, so just some things to keep in mind there. So when, you, so when you're traveling and then you're going into a hotel, for instance, you, you clearly don't want to mm-hmm. log into their Wi-Fi because that's, again, that's an open, that's a, a shared Wi-Fi. So are you, are you, are you, I mean, I know there's kind of technical, you know, some of them are logged on and so it's only guests only and what right. have you, yeah. but, but are you, so would you then say, you know, I know that for instance, you can buy, um, portable Wi-Fi, which you mm-hmm. can use your phone for or your laptop or whatever else. Is is that something right. that you recommend in terms of, you know, that as a simple cost, purchase a, a portable Wi-Fi through your, your provider and actually log, keep yourself logged onto that wherever you're going, because then you're getting better security. Absolutely. I mean, that that is a way to do it. Um, but if, if you think about it, um, those portable Wi-Fi, those pucks, if you will, that's essentially a cellular, uh, there's a, a SIM card in there, right? That's going to, or yeah, SIM card that's going to be giving you cellular data, right? It's running off of data. Um, and most of the time it's going to be the same as your cell phone provider. Um, one thing to note, if you are going to do that is, if because oftentimes you don't have service, right? That's the thing people always say is like, well, what happens if I don't have service? If you go the Wi-Fi puck route, you always want to make sure that that provider is different than your cell phone provider. Right. Yeah. Right. And so if you, you know, I have Verizon for my cell phone. So if I want to have a secondary or that, you know, that pace plan, we're talking about communication stuff now, my secondary option needs to be AT&T or right. T-Mobile, you yeah, know, yeah. whoever it may be. So if one is out, I can rely on the other. Um, so that is one thing to, that's one way to use it. Um, another way is to, again, use a VPN, right? right? If you have to, you, if you need to use uh, the hotel Wi-Fi, just to use a VPN. Yeah. Um, there's no one, one answer. Um, I, I like to tell clients, I give them, five or six different options. They go like a, the bike chain, right? And so I don't want to expect you to do all five or six things that I, I teach all the time because I don't do five or six things all the time. I'm not a crazy person. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, if you do a couple of things yeah. right all the time, it's going to drop you just below that threshold, sure. right? Just below, uh, make yourself a, a hard target to where that threat actor they may, they'll say, ah, it's too much time and resource. I'm going to go on to the next person. I'm going to go to the next person that's looking up, you know, whatever on free Wi-Fi. Yeah. You know, that's why all you want to do is just the whole, uh, you want to be faster than the person next to you if you're yeah, being yeah, chased yeah, by yeah, a bear. Yeah. <laughs> so when you so, okay, so you, you mentioned earlier, you look after, you know, celebrities, athletes, et cetera. So they fall into a different bracket where they may be, they may be targeted specifically because of who they are. Correct. What Correct. changes then? What, what what different things do you advise when you're trying to protect, you know, a high profile individual? Mm-hmm. Uh, much more scrutiny on the devices, right? Um, making sure that the education piece is much more focused on looking and seeing and making sure that the things that they're doing and their their pattern of life is correct, right? They're always being targeted. They're being sent very specific things. And so I always tell them, hey, take a second and just look at it. If you're unsure, have someone else verify. Um, The five, 10 seconds or five to 10 minutes that it takes for someone to verify uh, any type of correspondence or an email or anything like that could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars in the long run. Um, And so just getting them to, to take a breath, right? Um, but then also using certain um, uh, programs. We, we There's a company called Slash Next. Uh, they have a great malicious link filter that uh, can kind of put on the device to where um, you can let people live their life and do the things and, you know, essentially click whatever they want to click. Uh, and there's an added layer of security around it. Um, so that way, if they do click something, they uh 
you know, they're still protected. So sure. they're trying to build as many walls around them as possible. So it's a kind of layered security, but for a but for right. basic exactly. phones. Exactly. Yeah. And is there is there yeah. is there specific phones that are more secure than others? I mean, is you know, is an iPhone more secure Absolutely. than a different phone? Right. And there's even things is, uh, you know, there's, you know, the secure phones, black phones and stuff like that. Glacier is a great company. Uh, they have a, a great guardian program to where they have preloaded, um, essentially secure phones uh, for you. But then I prefer iPhones. I know I'm probably going to get a lot of flack from listeners from that, but uh, that they they're, they're just they're easier to lock down. They're easier to adjust settings across the board. Um, if you know what you're doing and you are a very tech techie uh, person, Android obviously is the preferred for them because they can change their own settings. Um, but with that is, you know, kind of with, with great power comes great responsibility. If you don't know what you're doing, you can really put yourself in a predicament there to where you're, you're very vulnerable. Um, so I would say to the everyday user, I personally, this has just been sure, personal sure. opinion. I, I recommend iPhones just because it's easier. It's a good blanket coverage for what they're doing. I actually like what Apple is doing now too with lockdown mode and and the, some of the privacy things. Um, there's some settings you can go through and you can sever uh, an Apple device, an iPhone from Apple, you know, from taking a lot of your behavioral analytics and your uh, significant locations and stuff like that. It's just much, much easier to harden, I should say. And, and again, I suppose the more apps that you're downloading, the more right. lifestyle information and, and other data that you're effectively sharing. So you have to think about, well, what apps am I downloading? You know, what am exactly. I giving away? Exactly. You know, third party apps, I want to say I've reading the reports, like 92% of exploits that are coming in right now are all coming from third party apps, right? You're, you're, you're something you don't have control over, right? You don't know where that information is going. Um, and so just being comfortable with, you know, you are downloading an app and you don't know what's going on on the, on the back end. Um, but yeah, you know, being, you have to be very careful with that, uh, so, with a third party. And so a third party app is what? Is that is that a non-Apple app is that what you make you're yes, referring yeah. yeah anything you know anything you're downloading to a phone that's not part of the apple universe right, right. yeah so. yeah okay so would you so in terms of your high profile clients and would you steer them away from conventional phones towards these more secure phones or do you just say no you can use a normal phone but you just need to secure it it honestly it just depends on the client and yeah. how how secure how deep they want to go um we have pro athletes and we have, uh, I'm sorry, celebrities, pro athletes, high net worth individuals that are very comfortable with just us coming in and locking their personal phone down uh, as much as we can. Again, you know, what's the point of having a smartphone if it doesn't do the smart things? So we're not turning things off, right? We're not, uh, not turning the whole, uh, you know, location services and everything else off because people want to use it. That's why people buy Apple phones because they are so interconnected. But going through and turning off, we've kind of established a baseline of things that we can turn off and make a, a regular um, iPhone as hardened, quote unquote, as you can and still be able to use all the fun things. Yeah. Um, but then also we have, like I said, for partners at Glacier to where if they want to go, they're doing some some crazy international travel. Um, they're, they're, they want that extra layer of protection. Then by all means, we'll point them and help them through that process of getting, you know, a, a, an actual secure, quote unquote, secure phone. And when you're talking about location settings then, so I mean, you know, yes, we all probably need location settings on some of our settings because that's that's how they work. Yeah. But what we don't yeah. need it on is everything, because of course then you're Correct. you're becoming very open and and trans you know trans transparent exactly. and that's when people can start tracking you and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. Just doing an audit, right? Um, oftentimes I'll go into a client's house and we just, first thing we do is you know let me see you know who all are you sharing your location with, right? Uh, there was a client of mine we went in and. Um, this person had met a colleague at a a conference um, and basically was like, hey, meet me at one of the happy hours, right? RSA conference. All the conferences have the happy hour afterwards, right? Um, meet me at this happy hour. Okay, I'm sharing my location. I'm here now. I'm just going to show you my location. Just come to me. Well, that's there's two different options there where you're permanently sharing location or you're sharing it in, um, for an hour or two. And I've seen to where you, you click a button, you don't think about what you're doing. And then this person had for the last year been permanently sharing their location with uh, a colleague of theirs. 
that they they didn't realize it, right? So oftentimes just doing an audit, right? Playing off of the ignorance and the be a, a person being naive to certain things. Um, so just doing an audit of what apps are actually taking your location. Um, I tell clients to to do the audit of um on location services and seeing, you know, nothing should say always, you know, when, you know, on the iPhone where it says always, uh, when using or off, when using is perfectly fine. Um, but we have clients too that use the, I think it's Live 360 and a couple other apps that, you know, tracking the children and stuff like that, where you have to have it on, sure. right? It's that give and take. It's yeah, that give and yeah, take. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. So, that, you know, this is this has been uh, fascinating. I think it's been really enlightening in terms of even if you know this stuff, it's always good mm-hmm. to get a reminder about actually, do you know what, when did I last check my phone? When did I last upgrade my phone in terms of the, you know, the, exactly. the security settings? Because I'm, I'm kind of religious about that. I'm, I'm always doing it. I have to kind of tell my wife, have you updated your settings? Yeah. Um, and there's yeah, a reason update, for that because that's, that's security big, updates. Right. That's the big thing too is, you know, um, I know we're getting short on time here, but, you know, two of the biggest things that can help you on the digital space are actually two of the most trivial things is to to update your phone. Make sure that your phone is updated, right? Most of the exploits are known exploits, and they're just targeting um, older versions of iOS or older versions of the operating system on your computer or your phone. And so just making sure that your phone is updated, making sure apps are updated. And then the most trivial is turn your phone off every now and then, right? Just reset it, turn it off for five minutes and then turn it back on. Um, And those, you know, that as a baseline will help you, you know, more than anything right off the bat. It's a good foundation. Yeah, well, those are two great tips to to, to finish on, I think, because I don't know anyone who doesn't have a phone these days and and kids seem to get younger and younger with phones. Um, And, um, you know, we, phones now are like computers. The, 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 The capability of them now is, is such that you don't really need an iPad or a laptop if you're carrying around. You can just find everything on your phone and do everything on your phone. So we're glued to the hip by them. Um, yeah. And so absolutely. those simple tips of, of you know, turning it off every so often to allow it to reset itself, making sure that you've got um, the latest security done. Because it's the reason it's a, a security update is because they've identified a vulnerability. So there's a clue there. Yeah, um, exactly. And, you know, looking at your location services and, and every so often – just going through it to see, well, actually, what have I opened up, or what can I close down that I don't need now, and and uh, uh, and that will that 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 that'll um, help keep you safer than you you might be. So, Ben, Absolutely. brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Anything else? Any last piece of genius wisdom that you've kept in your back pocket and you haven't <laughs> shared with us just yet? <laughs> um, multi-factor authentication. I think I would be remiss not to mention that um, in any type of discussion is. Uh, in today's age with technology and, and some of the exploits that are out there, uh, two-factor authentication isn't uh, a luxury. It's not an option anymore. you got to have it. Yeah. Right? If you don't have two-factor on, then you're behind the power curve, and, and you're you're it's irresponsible, honestly, it's in today's age. So two-factor authentication and update your phone. And what about – sorry, I know we, we've kind of finished, but was, you know, password managers, because – you know, I've just yeah, done, I've just yeah, done a, I've just done a piece of work on someone. He's got he's got you know we've identified one person you, you know use on about a hundred different things he's got. Um, but password yeah. managers are so simple to use. They are very simple to use, and again, going back to the Apple, uh, they have Keychain, which uh, to the everyday user is extremely easy to use. It's very intuitive, um, and it makes all the difference in the world when you're you know trying to come up with different passwords. Um, Third party password managers are also great. They kind of Pick your own flavor on which one's out there. Um, always pay for one, right? Uh, there's a free password managers, free VPNs, free this. But let's go back to just remember, you know, is it yours? Is it free? Is it secure? If it's free, you are the product, right? And so you kind of pay what you get for what you get. Um, so let's uh, try to have a, some sort of password management system. Yeah. Um, but then at the end of the day, though, some people just don't want to do it. It's too cumbersome. Um, and so what I tell clients is, you know, at least have three passwords, have one password for your, you make sure that your, like, say your Gmail password is completely different than anything else. Your banking password is completely different than anything else. And the password to get into uh, your cell phone company login is different. Uh, after that, you know, we can go into your discussion on how you should ha- use a password manager. But those three, at bare minimum, I, I beg people just to make sure those are standalone. Brilliant. Ben, thank you so much. Yeah. That, that's been um, 
really useful. And I know that people will listen to that. And they may not admit that they uh, have learned a lot there because they might think they already know some of this stuff. But I bet you there's people checking their phones or hopefully going to be people checking their phones and their other yeah. devices and and following a lot of the advice. So so once again, um, you know, Benjamin Baraton, we'll, we'll put the details of 360 Privacy, a great company based in the US but operate globally. Um, you know, jam-packed full of experts. We use them. We trust them. Um, and we'd highly recommend them to other people as well. Um, great to have you on again and uh, great to take some spend some time with you um once again thank you very much indeed yeah thank you thank you for listening to the diffuse podcast with host philip rendell ceo and founder of diffuse please rate review and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms